Welcome to chapter seven. Today I will talk about another perspective on the context of human resource management in organizations, namely the diversity of society and how that impacts uh, const the constitution of people within an organization and what that means for human resource management. In short, I will talk about diversity and inclusion and I will specify in this clip uh, the moral and legal views on diversity and inclusion. So after this clip, you will understand the following. Well, first of all, why, would, why should we bother about diversity and inclusion? Then I will dive into some moral perspectives on, on equality. And finally, I will tell you about the legal perspectives of especially focusing on discrimination. In the next clip, I will talk, talk about more the psychological aspects of diversity and inclusion because there are a lot of cues in psychology theories how to deal with actually diversity and inclusion in organizations. But let's first have a look at the moral and legal perspectives. Starting with defining diversity, what are we talking about? Well, go to the literature and you'll see that any difference between individuals on any attribute that may lead to the perception that the other person is different from oneself. That is a general introduction to diversity. So it can refer to multiple social demographic characteristics such as women, men, uh, are you local born or foreign? Uh, what kind of culture do you, do you bring? Uh, languages, religion, classes, age, disability. Another uh, characteristic of diversity is that it's often a distinction between a small group, the minority, and a larger group, the majority. So, for example, think about your own country. What is the majority group? What, does, what do they look like and who are the minorities in your country? Workforce diversity refers to the presence of perceived meaningful differences in characteristic between people that work together in a group. So it's just to refresh your, your, your mind and to, uh, to know what we are talking about, some examples of diversity that come, ac that come across in daily life. For example, the Black Lives Matter movement has pointed our attention to the disadvantaged position of many colored people in Western countries. Another issue that often confronts organizations is the difficulties that people with a... Um, uh, a disability have to, for example, enter offices. So they have a distance to the labor market, which is, in, which is um, highlighted by organizations not being willing to adapt to that. So that's an example where organizations can be discriminatory. Also think about older workers. To what extent is it really important that somebody has a certain age for a certain job, especially given that a lot of populations are graying and older workers are becoming a large part of the, of the workforce. And also, of course, think about uh, differences that, not, that are not immediately visible. So, for example, people with different gender orientations. All these identities, all these differences are brought to organizations and their people form a diverse workforce. And working together happily is not always automatic. There's some research by the best place to work into organizations that try to encourage the inclusion of minorities. And what's interesting to see from these graphs is that organizations that try to be as diverse as possible, so to include as, as many minorities as possible, they oftentimes focus on either, for example, gender um, equality, so promoting that women can uh, move to the, to, through the ranks of organizations, or, for example, ethnic diversity, making sure that your, that your workforce is as diverse as possible in terms of ethnic backgrounds. An interesting thing to see is that uh, according to this 2014 research, there are, there are very few organizations that succeed in doing both, so advancing minorities that are from different identi uh, identity backgrounds, so either women or ethnic is the, is the trend there. So this kind of illustrates that for organizations that want to advantage uh, minorities in their organizations, there's a lot of struggles to, to overcome. 
So one step back, why would organizations be interested in advancing diversity at all? So there are different reasons if you look into research um, that organizations say why they would like to have a diverse workforce. Some organizations say that they just believe, simply believe that it's the moral thing to do, it's the best thing to do. And they truly believe that all individuals uh, deserve equal opportunities. So they, they don't need to have any other arguments, they just say it's the right thing to do. Just to, being good means being inclusive to all people uh, that also inhabit uh, society. So societal demographics should be represented in the organization. They also feel that it's uh, just a simple societal responsibility to make sure that people are working and living together as harmoniously and without conf conflict as possible. That's the first reason organizations mention. Not all of them. There are also organizations that just want to adhere to rules and regulations, just to avoid that they are confl in conflict with any law. Uh, so the, legit legit the legitimacy requirement uh, also, for also brings organizations to focus on diversity measures. So think about, for example, um, agreements that are in laws that say that you have to have uh, non-discriminatory policies, uh, collective uh, uh, labor agreements can have uh, uh, clause that, clauses that lead to diversity management. Uh, and sometimes, for example, customers can be really uh, demanding that an organization takes into account uh, a diversity. The thing, for example, of uh, television shows, television programs, if you want to make a telev television show and you want to be funded by uh, some... Um, government-sponsored uh, institution, then one of the requirements might be that the cast that is on television is as diverse as possible. So that's an example of a legitimacy requirement that uh, brings organizations to work on a more diverse workforce. The last reason why organizations mention they want to work on diversity is that they hope or believe that uh, diversity will bring better organizational performance. So a lot of uh, talk is, is about that if you have a diverse workforce, you will succeed in uh, bringing more ideas to the organization and uh, this diversity will prevent uh, the group thing, so that everybody's thinking the same thing and that you overlook kind of uh, the other perspectives, uh, that you will have a broader access to talent and to networks and resources. And while this all sounds really, really nice, I have to warn you, so from an evidence-based perspective, the organization performance related to diversity, it's not that obvious. Uh, what, of, what oftentimes happens is that if you bring people from diverse backgrounds together, you also create a lot of tensions, a lot of difficulties. People don't automatically speak each other's language. So in a way, having a homogeneous workforce for optimal performance and coordination, that's easier. So the business case for performance is that if that's the only reason to advance diversity in your organization, it's a complex one. If you look at the effectiveness of policies in organizations from a research perspective, those organizations that have a through ideology that diversity is important and that we should do it, they have a better chance of making their diversity policies really work and land in the organization. So different reasons why organizations are interested in diversity. I will zoom in into the legitimacy perspective in the next slides because that's re that is related to uh, what we should do, what is laid out in the law. So go back to the United Nations Declarations of Human Rights founded in 1948 after a period of wars across the world. Uh, nations came together and decided that they would, in, in order to prevent future conflicts, they should have a global manifest to steer behavior of countries. So a big, big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, and the first article is already about diversity. Read with me. So all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should, be, and should act 
towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. So I'm going to zoom in on the word dignity and rights because these are leading in many of the laws that are applicable in different countries. So what does it mean, equal in rights? Equal in rights means that the same procedures apply to all individuals, no matter, no matter their differences. So also, we call this equal in procedures. So no matter who you are, no matter your age, no matter your race, no matter no, whatsoever, the procedure is the same for everybody. And this is called equality. Equal in dignity means that all individuals can enjoy the same benefits, so the same positions in organizations, mind, the same status and the same income, no matter who they are. So here it's not about the procedure and the process of getting there, but it's about the outcome. It's equal in outcomes. And in the literature, we know this type of equality as equity. So this, this distinction is important and it's also complicating diversity management. Let's, let's have a, a quick look uh, with using a picture what it actually means, the difference between equality and equity. So in this picture you see uh, examples of equity and equality. First the, the equality, so the equal in procedures. If everybody is to, you know, use their bike to go as a, as a, as a main form of transportation, and that's a rule, then everybody should have uh, yep, the same bike. And you see that giving everybody the same bike will probably have an advantage for some and a disadvantage for, for others, meaning that the person that is uh, most suited to this particular pr procedure will benefit from it, and those that do not easily match the procedure or uh, experience obstacles and hindrances in using it, they will not benefit eventually the outcomes. So if you want to make sure that there is equity, that people are equal in outcomes, you need to look into the procedures that lead people to these outcomes. Mind game. So in organizations that want to advance diversity because they believe in it, they have this difficulty that they have to balance between equality in procedures and equality in outcomes. So in on the one hand, same procedures for all, but on the other hand, distinguishing between people in procedures to make sure that you are diverse in all ranks of the organization. I'm going to build on this distinction between equity and equality uh, by turning to the model of Tomai who distinguish moral models that are used in organizations that justify uh, equality. So there are three models, and you will see that these relate to this distinction between equality and equity. So the first moral model is making sure that there's procedure or individual justice. So like I said, this means that the same procedure applies to all individuals, no matter their differences. And this, this means equality in procedures, which means, you know, it's e equality, like said. The second perspective is the equity perspective, and that means group justice. Group justice means that in an organization, all individuals can enjoy the same benefits. So no matter whether you're a man or a woman, no matter your age, you should be able to achieve the same position as, all, as the majority group, the same status, the same income. Now have a look at organizations and what, what do you see if you look into the higher levels of the organization? You'll probably see that the diversity of the higher levels is less than the diversity in the lower ranks of the organization. So typically in higher ranks of the organization, you, you see fewer women and you see fewer people from an ethnical background and you see hardly any people with a disability. So in order to promote group justice, at some point you need to violate the uh, procedural or individual justice because you need to push people. We are a little bit disadvantaged to the higher levels a final perspective that's trying to, um, to integrate a bit both is, to, is the equality in the recognition of diversity. 
And this is a, a relatively modern perspective. Equality in procedures means that everybody has the same vehicle to get somewhere. Uh, equality in outcomes means that we try to fit everybody to the same model, no matter their outcome, their, their, no matter their identity. Equality in recognition of diversity means that everybody has the right to be different. So that means it goes a, a step further than group justice. It means that, um, that you don't have to assimilate into the majority. You don't have to act like the majority in, in order to be part of the group. You are entitled to be your own unique self and to have merit in that and that you can still, or uh, you can just, like everybody else, benefit from everything uh, in the organization. So, whereas the uh, first two moral models kind of disregard the individual, the last model is really about celebrating that we are a diverse bunch of people in an organization. So what are the consequences for human resource management following from three, these three moral models? Obviously, I think the most easy one is that if you want to advance procedural or individual justice, it is important to check all the procedures in organizations and to see that these do prevent discrimination. Um, as, a, as a basic standard, you can turn to anti-discrimination laws. Uh, and the legal framework, they just say that you have to do that. There are all, also uh, consequences if you want to advance the group justice in organizations. For group justice, uh, you, you need to first analyze which minority groups are underrepresented in the higher ranks of your organization or in certain positions, and then you can start initiating, promoting rules for these specific minorities, and this is known as positive discrimination. I will say a few words about that in one of the next slides, uh, because positive discrimination has the word discrimination in it, which means that you're going to violate the procedure or individual justice. So advancing one group means discriminating another group. Difficulty there. The last one, equality as recognition of diversity. This is seen as the, um, uh, the future how human resource management should address diversity because if you manage to create a climate of inclusion where people just accept that we are not all the same, that there are people who pray during, uh, during the day, that there are people who have a dis disadvantage uh, in hearing or, or seeing, or that there... We don't, it's okay to be, to, to be different, and I, pr I value my colleagues, no matter who they are, for the work they do. And how can organizations advance such a, an, a climate for inclusion? This is, for example, by celebrating all the diversity that is inside the company. Celebrate, for example, Pride Week. Celebrate all the different um, holidays or festive uh, days that, have, that uh, adhere to the different religions. So make sure that the organization is just proud of being diverse. Okay. I'm going to turn to you uh, the complexities of uh, the first and second point. The first point being the procedures related to the law, and the second point trying to promote people from minorities in that, in that context. So what we need to do now is to have a look at uh, what does the law say about discrimination. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights also provides a statement about discrimination, and actually it's the second article of the, uh, of the declaration. And I'll read it out and highlight some of the words in there. So discrimination means denying people rights and freedoms. So that means you are going to exclude people. As set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, by making distinctions between people based on characteristics like race, color, sex, language, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. If you go to look up similar clauses in, for example, constitutional laws, you'll find that many countries have similar acts that 
discrimination is prohibited. And when it's prohibited, it means that if you do, uh, if you act in a discriminatory way, you are legally uh, viable. You, you, you can be punished for that. So the words, all the categories that are mentioned in the, uh, in the statement, these are called the legal grounds for discrimination. Uh, and if somebody discriminates another person in hiring, human resource management, for example, on basis on one of these legal grounds, then they are violating the law. This is an interesting thing to reflect on a little bit in the, in the, dis in the light of the discussion that we just had. So if you are an organization and you have rules in your organization for hiring, for example, then you need to make sure that these are all non-discriminatory. And then you want to promote women to the higher ranks of organizations. So how are you going to argue that um, men cannot apply? Because you are, in that case, denying, in this case men, the rights and freedom to uh, act uh, in the same way as, as, as women in this case. So how does it work? Because human resource management is all about making distinctions, honestly. Think about all the decisions that, that managers have to make all the time about employees. Who is going to be promoted? Who is going to be selected? How are the rewards distributed in the organization? So the legal framework is really, really important because that tells you what you can and cannot do in human resource management. So the law says as long as your decisions are based on merit, you can make distinctions between employees. And what is merit? Merit means that for a job, you know, or you have to demonstrate which uh, per performance criteria really matter to the outcomes of the job. So also for selection, you need to determine which criteria are really important for a good performance in the, in the job. And those criteria should be leading in the selection and nothing else. What is not allowed is, what is all the following. You cannot use one of the prohibited grounds for discrimination as a reason to make distinctions. So uh, you cannot say this job is not suited for women. Think, for example, we had an interesting case of women allowing women in the marines, and especially on submarines. And for a long time, the argument was, well, it's a, man's, it's a man's world. This is not suited for women. We have learned to have separate showers and things like that. And it went to the court and the judge said, no, this is not a reason why it should not be possible. You're making a disti distinction based on one of the prohibited crimes, in this case, gender, for this, and that's discrimination. So think, organization, think of a way. You have to make sure that women can work in this environment as well. So um, this is a, a case of obvious and clear, direct uh, gender discrimination. But oftentimes, discrimination is more subtle. And I'll show a little bit in the, on the next slide. So subtle discrimination is not immediately visible. That is what that it is leading to discrimination on one of the prohibited grounds for discrimination. But it does effectively lead to exclusion. If you look at uh, the grounds for discrimination uh, that are prohibited, you will see, see differences in different countries. So, for example, in Ireland, there is a, a, a prohibited ground against the, the travelers uh, community. So people of the travelers community are really highlighted in the constitutional law that they cannot be discriminated against. So you won't find this category in other countries because it's really specific to, uh, to Ireland in this case. In employment law, there are a few exceptions where it's sometimes allowed to make, um, to discriminate based on things that are normally not allowed. So for example, think about age discrimination. Um, the law makes, ex makes exceptions for, especially for uh, teenagers that they can't work in night shifts. Well, there's a protective uh, element to that law. 
And the same is, for example, for, for pregnant women. After a certain uh, time in their pregnancy, they are not allowed to do very heavy lifting anymore. So employment law comes on top of the, uh, the basic human rights law, and you should consult with that as well to make sure if you can make a distinction for certain groups that you cannot normally make distinctions about. So let's dive a little bit deeper in this distinction between direct and indirect discrimination. Direct discrimination, I just gave the case about the submarine uh, workforce and that women should be allowed. It's a case of direct discrimination. They are, uh, that means in this, that case they said women can't come because they are all women. So that makes a decision, distinction based on one of the prohibited grounds and that's basically not allowed. Indirect discrimination is defined as follows. So you ask a worker for a non-job related characteristics that event that leads to a systematic exclusion of people with certain characteristics that are listed in the prohibited grounds for discrimination. One example is uh, asking for example for language proficiency. So imagine that you have a, a cleaning job and you're looking for personnel to uh, to fulfill that position. And one of the requirements is fluid, being fluent in, um, in English. Imagine that somebody is perfectly capable of doing all the tasks in the job, but has a huge accent because they were foreign, foreign born. So a judge will say to what extent the real proficiency in the language is actually a requirement to perform well. Okay, you can ask, you can reason that it helps if somebody is able to express themselves in English, but really being fluent, and um, so you can't use that as a, a, a criterion because it's not really needed for the job. How can you prove that a criterion is really needed for a job? Well, that is very much a matter of doing a good job analysis. So really try to understand what is required in this job uh, and don't just go into a selection and saying, I, I think that this, is it, this matters, this matters, and this matters, and just let, let's just go, because there's a huge risk that your criteria will include prohibited grounds for discrimination indirectly. So let's turn back to the discussion that I raised before. In some cases, you do want to make a distinction. You want to make a distinction between, let's stick to the example of moving uh, women to higher ranks, uh, to have a more diverse management team um, and you need to actively push minority members to those levels in order to realize the, uh, uh, the equal division there. So when or how can uh, direct or indirect discrimination be justified? Well, one example of, of justification. So basically, bottom line, no, you can't do that. There is uh, anti-discrimination law that says that um, HRM should ensure that all policies meet the law and that, uh, that there is procedural and individual justice. So a judge will bottom line answer, if you want to make distinctions, it's not possible. However, if you can demonstrate that there, is really, there are really difficulties to achieve group justice so that there is systematic discrimination in the higher ranks of the organization and that you have tried another th a lot of things to make sure that, these, yeah, that, that it was solved, that you, for example, you, you, you trained all the minorities, you, you helped them, um, you, uh, you encouraged uh, uh, minority members to apply and still nothing much changes. If you can really, really demonstrate that, a judge will allow that you make distinctions based on one of these prohibited crimes for discrimination for a certain time until the situation is uh, resolved. There are examples, for, exa uh, uh, for example, in the, uh, in the academic context where the balance between um, the gender division in the higher ranks is, uh, is geared towards, towards men. Um, despite all the help that is initiated for women in lower ranks, uh, sometimes it really helps to just say this is a position and it's only open for women to make sure 
that organizations meet the targets that are required also from, uh, uh, from a government perspective to be diverse as a public institution. Okay, so now I come to the end of this presentation. Um, now you know which concepts uh, and definitions belong to diversity and inclusion. Um, we've also looked at reasons why organizations pursue diversity, and we have see, seen that um, if you are, have the moral belief that this is a stronger uh, position than what you do the legal or opportunistic um, reason. Um, we've also discussed Tomai's model with the different moral views on equality and how they lead on different views to how to advance diversity in organizations, so procedural, group or inclusion. And we've discussed a little bit the legal requirements about discrimination. I would like to make a disclaimer about the last one. Of course, it's a very brief introduction, and should you really have questions that concern the law, please turn to your legal advisors as well.